All right, hello, and welcome to the seventh and final session of our Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza Weekend. We're really thrilled to offer this panel discussion on the important subject of professionalism. This is a subject that is not always discussed, but is of such great Im impact to our lives as a musician. It's a multifaceted subject area, and we are so excited to offer this outstanding panel of experts to talk to us through some and talk with us about some important points on professionalism. So let's meet our panelists. So David Cook is principal clarinet of the Millican Decatur Symphony Orchestra and clarinetist for the Appian Duo and the Gray Line Duo. He is currently assistant professor of clarinet at Millican University and a clarinet faculty member at Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp. David is a Buffet Crampon USA performing artist and a member of the Silverstein Works Pro Team, performing exclusively on buff Buffet Crampon clarinets and Silverstein, Silverstein Works ligatures. And the wonderful Julia Heinen is in her 26th year as professor of music at California State University, Northridge, where she also served as associate dean for the College and Communication from 2016 to 2019. Prior to coming to Los Angeles, she taught at Valdosta State University and Luther College. She holds degrees from the University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, and Northwestern as Clyde Williams in the Minnesota Orchestra, Blayman from the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and Robert Marcellus of the Cleveland Orchestra. Jesse Krebs is in his 16th year as clarinet professor at Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri, where he's received the Truman Academic Innovation Award the William O'Donnell Lee Advising Award, and has been nominated five times for the Educator of the Year Award. He has performed guest recitals in Costa Rica, England, Thailand, and Ireland, and frequently performs as a substitute with the Kansas City Symphony. So you see we've assembled a wonderful collection of top professionals in the clarinet world here to talk with us today, and we're very grateful for their time, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you. Um, so we'll start, uh, we have several different talking points that we're going to, to begin with, and we're going to begin with setting the stage, the historical context and issues of access. So I'll ask our panel to go ahead and, and begin. Sure, I can start. I wanted to, first of all, thank the Amakicha duo for having us. Um, I've learned so much. In fact, I've washed my swab this weekend. I've tried <laughs> out this fingering for figuring out my embouchure. It's just been really uh, delightful and educational. So thank you for having us. Um, yeah, we just wanted to, to start by kind of acknowledging and framing our discussion today um, with the realization that for decades, aspects of professionalism have been used in ways that limit um, opportunity and access for especially people of color, women, um, other marginalized and disenfranchised groups, um, especially those lacking financial resources and education, uh, the idea that you have to dress a certain way, that you have to look a certain way, talk a certain way, wear your hair a certain way. Um, and we just want to frame this in a way that's more inclusive for our clarinet community and, and try and frame this in a way of educating through empathy uh, to try and uh, kind of open up more doors for people, not less doors, and not use this as an obstacle for people to, to get jobs and to, to be accepted into programs and things like that. Um, there's actually a really great article that I read a couple years ago, it's online in case anybody's interested, it's called The Bias of Professionalism Standards. And it's the Stanford Social Innovation Review um, by Isa Gray. And um, she does a really great job of kind of highlighting the origins of how Western white culture has kind of perpetuated these ideas of uh, professionalism and how we need to kind of break some of those down so if we want to move forward with, with true diversity and different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Jesse, uh, um, for your great uh, setting the stage for that. And I, I also want to thank Diane and Denise for the invitation to, to come here and present. It's, it's terrific. I've so enjoyed the weekend. I wish we would have this every weekend. So please set it up for next weekend and every weekend <laughs> following. Because <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't much work for you guys. <laughs> um, I want to um, also, uh, you know, talk about um, really uh, the historical context of this issue of access and professionalism in the music industry. Um, and I'll just use myself as an example. When I started playing clarinet and started being serious about clarinet, there were only two female professional clarinetists in the world at that time, or uh, 
and uh, in the United States, Michelle Zukowski and Elsa Verdere. And I had no chance to study with a female clarinetist. Now, I didn't at that time give it much thought. But years later, after studying with my first teacher, he made a comment to me that started me thinking about, wait a minute, I need to think about this differently. He said, you know, I'm, I'm, I was so surprised by you. I had no idea you were that serious about music. Hmm. And, I, and so I said, well, why would you think that? And he goes, well, you know, because you're a woman, you're gonna get married and have children. Well, I started thinking about that. What did I not tell him about my goals? And so I no longer wait for students to tell me what they want their goals. I start that conversation because of an offhanded comment of a teacher. I also want to comment on something that I purposely do not do. Um, I didn't take clarinet lessons until I got into college. Um, and uh, when we audition students for my university, I purposely never ask a student that because it sets up a socioeconomic barrier for those students. Instantly, they think they should have had lessons prior to coming to college, which is absolutely not true. Um, but it's also, you know, honestly, I can tell from just hearing what they're doing, the passion at which they want to pursue this. And now it becomes my job to teach them what they need to know to open up the next doors that they may want to go into. Mm -hmm. And I'll kind of uh, piggyback on what Julia was saying, you know, it's just going off of what she was saying about lessons, you know, I, a lot of my maybe most achieving students are co that are coming in and I think everyone is, has instances of this or maybe they're not the ones with le that have had access to lessons before before starting college. It's in it's uh, like what Julia said, the passion and the work ethic that really manifests itself just as much as if you had the money to, you know, spend thirty, sixty dollars, whatever, a week. And that that's that's a huge point, is not just the sort of barriers that we put up, but how are we what are we doing to actively deconstruct those? And Julia makes an excellent point on that. I, I kind of wanted to say before we really launch into this that all of the the Black Lives Matter movement and everything has um, really caused me to sort of reframe and reconsider everything that I'm doing as a teacher. And I think that one of our, you know, we're not just teaching the clarinet, and the, we're teaching sort of human and personal development and growth. And some of that is how do we conduct ourselves, but also how are we, you know, not just teaching everyone to talk and dress and act a certain way, but understanding where where students and where people are coming from in terms of different cultures, different backgrounds, and trying to um, sort of meet in the middle and come to a more inclusive environment. All right, shall we move on to our next? All right, so person, clicked resolution, colleagues, teachers, professors, and thoughtful, considerate gestures. So I guess I'll start with this one. Um, I, I want to talk about um, what, what would be the right thing for a student to do when they feel like there's a conflict with um, a person in authority, a teacher, um, a clarinet teacher, an ensemble director, um, a professor in a class, band director, any kind of thing. Um, and while this may be a difficult thing, it is something you should prepare yourself to do and look forward to the time uh, when you're an adult and this is what would be expected, which is the first thing you do is address it with the person you're having the issue with. And you don't address it in, a, in an accusatory way. You address it in a way that would talk about, you know, I could see that you were upset with me at my last lesson. Could we talk about that? I would really like to know what your expectations are. You'll be surprised at sometimes the answers you'll get and you'll hear uh, a professor say, oh, you know, it wasn't you I was upset with. I had a meeting right before this and I was frustrated with colleagues, but honestly, you were, you were 
prepared. Now, there was one thing I thought you could have been more prepared on, but I just wasn't in the place. Or you might hear from an ensemble director. You know, I didn't feel like you were really taking this part seriously. You know, here's what I need you to do to prepare better. Then, first of all, the person you're dealing with knows that you're very serious about this. And second of all, you've taken the, the burden off of them from not accusing them of, hey, you really made me upset the other day you know, when this happened, and then they instantly go to a place. But that uh, that would be the first step to resolving a conflict. And I'm going to say probably that's going to resolve 99% of the conflicts that you ever have. Um, the next step would go to the next person up. So if you're in a college situation, it would be visiting the department chair. And hopefully the department chair is going to say, hey, let's have a meeting with you and the teacher and you can resolve it with a, th with a third person in the room. But really, this is the first thing you want to do about resolving conflicts that you have with colleagues, that you have with uh, people in authority, that you have with anyone, is deal with the person first. And to kind of dovetail off that, um, when I was thinking about professionalism, I was thinking about the people who I always aspired to uh, growing up, both my mentors, my teachers, um, other professors, um, people that I wanted to be like when I grew up um, and still want to be like when I grow up. Um, and I just feel like they show consideration for everyone and it doesn't matter their status, secretaries, janitors. Um, you never know when you're going to get locked out of a room and you need someone to help you get into the room. Um, just taking an effort to be kind and thoughtful uh, to other people will get you um, further than anything else. And I think for me, the professionalism equals kindness. Um, taking the effort, I think in, in the master class yesterday, um, maybe it was you, Denise, that said thank, sending a thank you card after you take an audition just goes a whole long ways. Um, those thoughtful gestures that some people do um, just make a huge uh, difference, I think, both in the world, but also to kind of establish you as a professional in your discipline. Definitely. Going, um, going off that, it reminds me of something I was uh, reading once. There was, um, they were talking about when athletics teams bring these prospective athletes to campus and they're showing them around, giving them the big tours and everything. And one coach said that they one of their biggest things is how do those people treat the support staff? How do they treat the administrative uh, assistants? And that, that just really kind of rang with me in that you never know who is going to be able to do something that has an impact on your life. And it's like you, you want to always be the bigger person. And even if someone does say, you know, maybe does something to you that, you know, offends you, you want to um, go back and, you know, bring it up directly with that person in a non-confrontational, non in a friendly manner, instead of talking, you know, you know, gossiping, griping about it behind someone's back, because it's just so much easier to handle things directly. And I think one of the things that really comes into play here is with students in ensembles, like chamber music groups, they're, you know, it's sometimes it's easy to say, oh, this, I can't believe this person messed this up again, or did you hear how person this person sounded in rehearsal but it's just like you know we'll, and we'll get to this later but just don't just don't don't gossip don't be trying don't be that person you know always always be the bigger person and remember that you might not know what a person is going through on the in their life that is maybe impacting what they're what they're doing um in that small sliver of time that you see them at so important right so important that we Especially, I um, always worry because I've, I've had students come to me before who have a, an issue with another professor and they're terrified to, to say anything, you know. And so these are great tips for helping them to feel empowered to just not to be aggressive, but to speak up for themselves and to know that they have rights too to be able to help resolve a con conflict. And it's a great learning tool to help them in their professional lives as well, right? And it's, and it's so much better to do it sooner rather than at the end of the semester on a student evaluation right. because boy you could you know just because of a misunderstanding or like you said whatever's going on in that particular professor's life at a particular that lesson could have affected that situation it's just so much better to to deal with it you know um, as soon as you can so I think that's great advice yeah. that's great advice Denise and Diane, let me follow up with that. Um, I uh, And this is because I'm the clarinet teacher, I often have students come and they'll say, 
oh, the orchestra teacher, you know, yelled at me in rehearsal today. I'm really upset about it. I start every one of those conversations as, what do you want the outcome to be? And their answer is usually something like, well, I want them to know that I really know how to play this and I do it really well. I say, okay, let's start to craft your talking points that you're going to bring up to this, you know, conductor and you're going to do it in this kind of a way. Hey, you know, uh, Dr. Smith, I'm talking, you know, I know I upset you. You know, could you help me? What was I not doing in rehearsal? And then you're going to hear and you're going to take notes and you're going to be serious about it and you're going to finish that conversation by thanking them and saying, I won't let you down again. And it, it's, but Diane is so right. Please don't take this out on a student evaluation. It's not going to solve any issue. And you actually may be causing for a moment of, of uncomfortableness in a rehearsal that you had, you may be causing somebody a career-ending comment. Not that that happens because of one comment, but it's just, it's something you may not understand what the full implication of that could be. Communication is just always the key. Just communicate. <laughs> and it goes both ways. I, I had a student a couple years ago that anytime I asked them to do something, they kind of had a snarky comment for me. And it got to the point where we were in a rehearsal with the coaching and I finally just said, you know what? I don't appreciate the way you're talking to me. <laughs> I, I said, I feel like you're being disrespectful. And she was really surprised. She said, oh my gosh, I didn't mean that at all. Uh, you know, this weekend my grandmother died and I've been trying to deal with that. And I feel like I've been kind of snarky in general. And we both had this moment. And it was really great. And otherwise it would have festered with me and I would have been, you know, all week have, have thought about it. And I'm so glad that I just confronted her and just said, what's up? This isn't cool. We need to talk about it. And, and I, I think that that was uh, good for both of us to have that moment. Yeah. Awesome. And well, sometimes, well, oh, yeah. No, and I was just going to follow up and say that sometimes that's just different interpersonal reactions with people. Some people, you know, sarcasm is kind of, you know, just part of their general mantra or, you know, the way they interact. And some, it's not, it's often not disrespectful, but sometimes, again, culture or familial values, it can be perceived as something else. So it's really just important to kind of, again, just, I think, be open with people, not mm -hmm. blunt necessarily, but be open. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, let's now kind of delve into professionalism and performance arenas, um, you know, rehearsals, concerts, uh, teaching, endorse, you know, etiquette, uh, going to recitals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, let's start that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll, I'll comment. Um, let me talk about um, attending recitals. So it's really important in the professional world and you're doing this when you're a student um, is to actually show support for your colleagues and your teachers by attending their performances. Um, can you imagine doing a senior recital and not having your own teacher show up? Well, I've actually had a friend who confessed that to me, that their own teacher didn't show up to a performance, to their senior recital. And how I asked about it is I was invited to his wedding and I said, hey, you didn't invite your teacher. You know, they didn't show up to my senior recital. And this had been like 20 years earlier. So let me tell you, that gets remembered for a long time. But as a student, it's really important to, sh to show support for your teacher and, you know, guest artists and all, all kinds of things. Um, you know, the band director is doing a presentation at a conference that you're at. Go! Show support. And not only show support by attending, go up to them afterwards and say, hey, I really learned a lot. I really enjoyed this. I'm so glad you did it. I'm, wow, what an honor for our school. I mean, say something nice. Like, you know, boy, your performance of that was so great. Or, you look terrific and you're, the coordination between you and the pianist was such an inspiration to see. Wow, I had no idea. So mm -hmm. show support for your colleagues and that's professional courtesy to do, to do things like that. 
and not only your teacher, but other woodwind teachers at your school. Um, I, I missed a flute performance of the flute professor in my undergrad. And when I went in for my next clarinet lesson, my teacher said, well, I hope that you put a note in her box explaining why you weren't at her recital and apologizing and saying, sorry that you missed it. And I thought, oh, no, I haven't done that. And that would be a great idea. And so that was a learning moment for me. But, you know, a lot of times we can learn uh, just as much from non-clarinet recitals. And in fact, I'd say, one of the best musicians on faculty here is our oboe player. I would love her to hear all my students to hear the way that she phrases and uh, just everything she plays is musical. And, and so I, I feel like they can learn a lot by attending, you know, other things other than just clarinet recitals as well. I, I, I recall a similar situation to Jesse as an undergrad where I, our, where I was going to school, we were hosting the um, College Music Society Regional Conference and being a college kind of college student. I don't think I even knew what CMS was at this time, but I remember my, our, my professor said, you know, over the next, uh, on the lesson following that weekend, it's like, why didn't you go to any of these great things that were happening here? And it's just like, didn't, didn't know, but it's like, I also probably should have been aware that these things were happening. It's a great chance for development. And, you know, you hear, I feel like the, one of the great, some of the greatest like most memorable things that have impacted my clarinet playing were definitely not clarinet performances at all. So it's about becoming, uh, kind of having that intrinsic motivation and desire to keep bettering yourself at any level and realizing what you can take away from things that are, that are not so clarinet linear focused. Now, of course, at the recital, please turn off your devices. There's nothing worse than having two rows up in front of you, having this light that kind of like blinds you as you're trying to watch the recital you know, and keep your feet off the seats and just be respectful of those around you. Um, keep in mind that a lot of times, especially in classical music, but other types of music as well, we want to hear every little nuance and um, you miss a lot of that when there's other things going on. And so if you can just wait that 50 minutes to turn on your device, it really makes a big difference. Well, and also at, when you become an alumni and you're in the area or you still live in the area, you know, it's not like you're your relationship with your teacher or the other teachers at your school ends when you graduate. You know, you may need a letter of recommendation. You may actually need recommendations for your studio that you're running. But, uh, you know, plan, hey, this is a big deal for anybody to play a, a recital. So make an attempt and uh, to go. And if you can't go, I mean, make sure you let them know and and say i'm so sorry i wasn't able to be there is there any way i can hear the recording of it they would i'm sure be more than happy to share it with you you know it's just and and i will say a moment of etiquette in that regard don't send someone an email two hours before their recital and say you can't come <laughs> you know either it's a few days before or you're going to wait until after but two hours before somebody's about to walk onto stage to say, oh, by the way, I can't come, is not a really, you don't want that in their head. It's disheartening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about rehearsal etiquette? That's a big one. That is a big one. Do we Especially have two hours? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah. go ahead, Julia. Jesse, no, you go ahead. I, I was just gonna say to try and be as prepared as you can. Um, before you even get there. So um, one of the stories, you know, a couple years ago, I got called to sub with an orchestra and I just gotten a brand new reed case. And I had shown my wife how, how proud I was of this awesome reed, reed case and, you know, showed her the reeds that fit in it, whatever. Drove three hours to go to this rehearsal with a professional orchestra that I was really excited to play with. Um, and got there in plenty of time. I got there maybe an hour before, went downstairs and started warming up, kind of going over the parts and realized that I had left my reed case on the kitchen table where I was showing my wife. <laughs> I thought, oh no, you know, uh, freaking out. Luckily I had a couple of spare reeds in my case, but because I had that hour, I managed to work on those reeds, get one playable that I felt proud of, that I could go and play a good rehearsal and I used that time wisely. Now, if I had come, you know, five minutes before rehearsal started, it would have been a nightmare. And uh, so I guess, you know, try and get there early, be as prepared as you can, obviously have your reads, um, but, <laughs> but if you can know your parts and um, just treat every rehearsal like it's a performance. Um, when I was at, at um, my master's degree, I felt like every time we had ensemble rehearsal, everyone was ready to perform the music right then. And I didn't want to be that guy that wasn't ready. Um, and I just feel like that, 
that uh, raised the whole ensemble, the level for everyone. And, and we really all felt like professionals every time we had rehearsal. Yeah, I'll follow up on that a little bit. Um, yeah, get there early. Um, make sure uh, that you're sitting down and warming up and, and not chatting with somebody who's trying to warm up themselves. Everybody's there for a, to do a job. And so it's not that you can't talk to anybody, but it's like, hey, hi, how are you doing? Fine, done, sit down, get ready. Be ready when the conductor walks in or whatever the rehearsal is about to start and you are ready to go. You know, and this is business and we're gonna get this done and don't fool around. Um, and, you know, it's always a good idea to um, make sure you're courteous if you're playing second or if you're playing another part um, and you've played principal on that, don't play the solos for the, that the principal's about to have to do. It's just not really a nice thing to do. Practice or really any more. excerpt. Warming up on excerpts is kind of, yeah. Oh. You know, I always make a joke when I go down to LA Phil and I can tell the people who are just newly subbing because they're there practicing excerpts. And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, focus Life, on the music. Life's too short to just play excerpts. <laughs> <laughs> but go, going off of that, that reminds me, um, yeah, be, I'll, always be there on time, you know, and I especially, you know, Granted, we all have very busy lives, but try and be there so you're not the person who's like, you know, five minutes before downbeat traipsing in with the cases. And then, you you know, we're clarinet players. We have usually a, we have a big case. There's probably another case or a folder or a bag or something. Just try not try not to be disruptive when you're getting in and going off of um, kind of what we said about excerpts and don't play the solos. Play the music that you're there to rehearse. Warm up on that. Don't be warming up on you know, the, or the loudest possible thing you can play or the concerto you're working on for your competition or something like that. You know, it's, you're, you're there to do, always there to do a job and you kind of want to, I always find it helps to sort of hone in on what you're playing, what you're going to be playing for the next uh, two and a half hours or so. And that kind of sets the stage for what you're going to, what the music making that you're going to do in that next period of time is going to be. I also like to view rehearsals as a team building um, opportunity that it's not me against them. But if I'm playing second clarinet as a sub, I'm trying to help the first clarinetist to play their best. And if that means help keep track of their rehearsal um, rest so that when they come in on their solo, it's going to be beautiful, then I'm happy to do that. If that means that they need to borrow my pencil, you know, whatever I can do to be a team player, to make sure that I thank them afterwards for having me, thank the conductor for having me, all those things kind of go a long ways as well, because it's not just about you, but um, who knows if, if you'll be asked back again, those kind of things are really important. And thank the contractor for the call. You know, um, and when you're on your way to a gig, make sure you have the contractor's phone number. Um, a few years ago, I was playing an orchestra concert in Santa Barbara, and I live in Los Angeles, and, and there's basically one way to get to Santa Barbara. Well, there was an accident on the freeway, and the freeway shut down for an hour and a half. Mm. Um, so I called the contractor, whose first comment was, you're my 40th phone call about this. <laughs> Great. Okay, so they actually held the concert, you know, because the entire orchestra basically is coming from Los Angeles to get there. So he knew in time that they can let the box office know and said, we're going to be starting late. And so they ended up starting about a half an hour late uh, with the, most of the orchestra actually there. So, you know, always a good idea to be really professional. And if you're on a wait, you're, if you're going to be late, you know, not just late to the rehearsal, that would be horrible, but late for call time, which is mm -hmm. half an hour before or so, whatever your orchestra says, um, call and let the contractor know, I'm so sorry there's traffic here, I'm going to be late. And let me tell you, that contractor's going to remember if you called before and before with that same thing. And they're going to say, you know, you're always calling me, telling me you're going to be late because of the traffic. So be early. So Jessica put a comment in here, which is right. If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. 
Yeah, I think for our younger me members who are watching, um, these, this is such great feedback and, and information for them. They need to remember that they're learned, you're talking about professional jobs, but while they're students, they need to be practicing these skills so that they're ready to be that professional person. Mm -hmm. right. I've yeah, and we, I'm sorry, Denise, go ahead. See, I, I always say, that, you know, many times, I think I've said it most every session, the, the student you are is the professional you will be. So you start now developing those skills. And, you know, chamber music is a wonderful opportunity, situation to practice many of those skills because you don't have a conductor leading the, the group. And so, you know, you learn how, how to talk and communicate with one another by being very professional in how you approach intonation. You can't just say, you're out of tune. That comes across as really rude. Now, if, you know, I'm a member of a woodwind quintet, the Moran Quintet here at the University of Nebraska, and we've been together this particular group, uh, well, now two years because we had a new, new bassoon professor, but, you know, we've been living together, some of us, for 20 some years. We know each other really well. We have more of a shorthand. But if you're a college student, you probably are in a group for the first time and you have to learn some of these ways to approach a respectful conversation. Um, and so just always remember, how would I like to be told something? And that's how you need to frame it. You usually use, use the pronouns, we need to think. <laughs> I'm you know, having and, trouble tuning this one note. Let's right. take a look at that. Right. Can there's there's we, a yes. lot of pride swallowing when you go when yeah. you go into these. Sometimes I, I remember. Yeah, I think we've all, probably all worked with. Well, I hope we have it, but most of us have worked <laughs> with the person who is. They are right, and they cannot be told anything else. And you just kind of have to. Be be again the bigger person in all of these situations, and you know you can. That's for the. The, the drive after when you're like stewing to yourself or something, but keep 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 what you want to say inside. Right. We I play with a contemporary group called Tempo, which is a kind of expanded Piro ensemble: violin, viola, cello, uh, flute, clarinet, piano, percussion, and conductor. We st and we do crushed series of rehearsals before our performances, so we'll have and. We're rehearsing for hours uh, because it's complicated music and we often have composers there. Well, before the composers come, and even while the composers are there, we start every rehearsal by saying, what are we going to accomplish? And we finish every rehearsal by saying, what are we going to accomplish next time? And it's interesting what people, different people in the ensemble will say, hey, can we spend some time on this section in this piece? Absolutely. And uh, one of us is always taking notes. And then another person will say, you know, for me, I need us to run this piece all the way through next time. Fantastic. But it's pretty interesting that what I think needs to be done is never what anybody else in the group needs. So that actually focuses our time because then we're not wasting anybody's time and we actually feel like we're getting what we need to get accomplished done. I love that. Yeah. Isn't that a great way to approach practicing by yourself too? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, I finish every practice session. I mean, anybody who, and all my students know I have a little notebook I write stuff down in that I practice that day. The last thing I write down at the end of the day is what am I going to do tomorrow? Brilliant. Let's carry this over to conventions if we can, because mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot to be talked about with etiquette at conventions. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I try, if at all possible, is just never be negative at a convention, never be critical overly critical, especially in public. Um, you just never know who is sitting next to you or in front of you in the concert. It could be a student of the performer. It could be uh, somebody related to the performer connected. Um, I'll never forget, I was at um, one of the ICA clarinet fests and walked up to a booth. I was gonna buy this clarinet CD because I really liked all the pieces on it. And I didn't have recordings of these pieces, but I didn't really care for the style of the artist. And it wasn't my favorite, um, you know, my go-to sound and that kind of thing. And I almost sent a comment to this person who was selling it and I decided not to. And I just bought the CD and kind of moved on my way. Well, it turns out that this was the husband of the performer and I would have just really you know, put my foot in my mouth. And I am oh. so glad that I um, 
you know, just kind of kept my thoughts to myself. And once you get to your hotel room, you can say whatever you think, but I just encourage everyone to, um, to, you know, the clarinet world is very small. You never know who you're talking to. Everybody knows everybody. I think it's always best just to keep a positive vibe at these conventions. And um, I think you'll be better for it. <laughs> yeah. Don't be yeah, and going off of that, it's all, um, it's always so, such a small network and you, you don't want to close any doors that, that you might other, have otherwise been open if you had just kind of either kept it to yourself or, you know, cut, there's always some positive way, some positive thing you can say about something going on at a convention, you know, there's, and you always be respectful of the fact that people, everyone is investing time and, um, um, often, you know, expenses to get here and we want to be, we want to honor those, um, those investments. So even if maybe you didn't care for the way someone played, that person probably practiced that for hour, you know, hours and hours on end. So you want to be um, be respectful and recognize that they wh what they did in uh, bringing this to you because it takes a lot of it takes a lot of courage to get up on a stage and play or present. And how would you feel if if someone if someone was saying that about what you did? You know, probably not too great. So kind of, I like to just kind of fall back to that at all times. De yeah. Denise knows this, but I learned this from uh, a, a colleague when I first got to Lincoln. And, uh, and he said, well, just remember this, no matter how you play, you're going to make someone happy. <laughs> and what he meant by, and that's what I think when I go and I play mm -hmm. at a conference, I'm like, you know, I know not everybody's going to love my playing and that's okay. You know, but that helps me get through it as a performer because I'm just going to do what I do and just know that, yep, someone's going to complain about it or someone's going to love it. And there you have it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that way of thinking. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. And when you're at a conference, go and hear things. You know, it, it makes me so annoyed when, you know, I see people who never walk into a concert and they're at a conference. You know, and the other thing professionally, what really bugs me is I'll have colleagues who will tell me, well, I don't go if I'm not playing. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, what a disrespectful thing for your colleagues. You know, we as clarinetists, unfortunately, have one professional conference a year. If we don't go to that, what are we, you know, what are we doing? So make sure you go to your professional conference. And if you don't go because of whatever, hey, make sure you reach out to the people that you know and say, I would so love to hear you play this, you know, at this conference, but I'm not gonna be able to go. Um, I'll tell a story from when I went to I went to Oklahoma Symposium long before they had the new hall, but I was sitting in, and they used to have concerts in the band rehearsal room. Yeah. Okay, so I was sitting at this con this concert that was, I don't know, maybe 20 people because it was in the morning, and Lauren Kitt was playing Joan Towers, um, uh, you know, fantasy, uh, and it was relatively new work then and for mm -hmm. lauren kidd who was principal clarinet of national symphony for him to actually spend the time learning a new unaccompanied work it was like wow i mean i was totally impressed so in the row it was like you know larry combs was sitting right next to me and a few other you know really big name clarinetists i was not a big name clarinetist but lauren kidd gets to the end of that and it ends on that high f sharp that fades out to nothing um and it kind of cracked at the end of it just a little bit. And these two students sitting behind us start, oh, could you believe that? I would never do that if I was playing. Okay, Larry Combs stood up and turned around and just read them the riot act. And I'm sure they had no idea that Larry Combs was sitting in front of them. But I was never so proud of anyone to, for him to stand up and just say, you have no right to say this. Here's the here's where this person is, and here's Lauren Kidd, who sounded fantastic, on this. And it's like a concert at eight o'clock in the morning, you know. And I was just like, wow. So don't. So Jesse's point about don't ever say anything is absolutely true. You never know what somebody. I mean, somebody may have flown in the night before, and their plane was late, and they got in at four in the morning, and they've got a concert at eight o'clock. And 
and this is live music and we're all human. We're, we're in such a recording digital age that everything has to be perfect and it's just not. And so I think it's, it's uh, refreshing for me to hear others not play perfect because it's like, okay, I have the rights to, you know, to do my best. Well, my first teacher would tell me if people wanted to hear perfection, they would stay home and listen to a record. And it's absolutely true. We go to hear live music to hear live music. And it is, you know, and I'm always disappointed when I come off out of the one out of a thousand performances that was perfect. And I'm like, oh my God, it was perfect. And no one notices. And I'm like, wait a minute, it was perfect. Really? But they don't, yeah. <laughs> Nobody says, wow, that was perfect. Yeah. All right, should we move on? Yeah. So let's talk about um, flexibility and, and diversifying your musical experiences. What can you do to embrace change and, and new things in your professionalism? I think there's always something to be taken away from just learning, um, just being more open to what we listen to as musicians, not just in terms of like going to hear other mediums like you know, saxophone or trumpet or strings or whatever, but just being more open and not dismissive of certain styles or genres or composers. You know, I, I was just, uh, I was just reading on Twitter actually, as someone who said that a composer who said that like four or five people in their doctoral program had yelled at them because they didn't like Mahler, and it's just like that. Just seems like like just such a random thing to get really worked up about but it it just reminded me that we won't try, we know, we don't want to be so narrow minded because again just be it's really your personal preference and what someone doesn't like or what you might not like someone else might love and really you know that music really connects with them so i'm trying to always you know i now i have personal preferences but trying to be open and okay what is something i can take from hearing this avant-garde 20th century piece or what is something I can take from this uh, you know this hip-hop song that's you know on the radio and just trying to remember that we get classical music can feel very elitist at times especially in terms of culture and I think we call we do need to kind of just like strike that strike that idea down well yeah, help your I... your classical playing too I, I had uh, the opportunity to say some jazz in my undergrad and now I, when I play pieces like Horvitz Sonatina uh, pieces that are semi-jazz inspire kind of this third stream of classical and jazz mix. I feel like I can play them a little bit more authentically because I have a little bit of a background and knowledge and understanding of jazz and how it swings. Um, and if you can even broaden out more and learn saxophone and flute, then all of a sudden you can get Broadway pitch show gigs and kind of broaden your horizons as far as your opportunities for performances and gigs. Um, so I think that uh, both style, musical style, and even instrumentation could be further by just um, opening up your mind a little bit and trying new things. I had a student a couple years ago that for their capstone project um, decided to re research klezmer music. And as a new pro professor at the time, I didn't know very much about klezmer. And one of the things I love about this job is that I'm always learning. And so we learned together and he put together a really nice uh, project, ended up converting to Judaism and is now a rabbi in St. Louis. So you just never know where your projects might take you. Um, but for me, that was a really great learning experience. And, and now I love the style and I don't play it well, but, but I feel like um, a new door had been opened up for me. Yeah, I started, I, I'm, I started learning Klesmer about three years ago um, by joining this just interesting little group of all Jewish people who are not professionals at Klesmer, but uh, just not, and not professional musicians, but they play Klesmer and they grew up playing it. And I kept getting this question from them always, you know, why would you want to do this? And I'm like, because I love the music. But, you know, they're like, but you're not Jewish and you're a woman, you know, and it's like, yeah. And so I've actually, you know, had some Klesmer gigs where um, that was an issue that, you know, I could not be at this gig because there were orthodox men in the group. And so I was not allowed to play. Um, it's, but for me, and I'm terrible at it, but I actually love just doing something for the joy of doing it. It seems like, I don't know, it just seems fun. It just seems fun. 
to be able to do it. Not that classical music isn't fun, it is, but it's a similar thing, like I really liked playing contemporary music because I always have to figure out something. There's something in a new piece that, wow, I don't know how to do this. So that for me is what is true with um, non-Western music is, wow, I just don't know anything about this, so I get to learn about it and I get to look it up. and. You know, where I live in Los Angeles, I'm often, I often have students who grew up uh, playing like uh, banda music. And so they're always saying, oh, no, but this is how you do this. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. So get to a place where you're constantly exploring. Because the, the line, uh, and depending on where you live, but the line in Los Angeles between classical, Western classical, and non-classical is blurred. So we have, you have to be able to do anything out here, movie music, back up a pop singer, back up a rap singer. There's all kinds of things that you're going to have to do. I taught a music camp at the Florida Keys and a student brought in a conch shell that she had um, sanded off the edge and was playing it for me. And I thought, oh, this is really stretching me here. I don't know if I could learn how to play this, this shell, but <laughs> you never know what you might get asked to play at a gig. That's true. All right. Um, let's move on to professional engagement and how professionalism um, corresponds with just overall professional development, networking, how you approach being in professional organizations and serving those professional organizations. I just try and say yes a lot. Um, if things are asked of me, I just say yes. I did twice today by email. Um, basically, um, you, you might think that your time is crunched, but um, it can, you always have time to do these things. And I, I feel like they really pay off. Not only um, does it help your credibility, but then it, you meet people. And I've met people from all different places, whether I served on some panel or judging or whatever. And um, so I just try and, and yes is my mantra. And it might be my downfall, but, um, but I feel like that's, that's the thing is just to get involved and just to find a place where you can help serve and, and uh, help be a part of something bigger than yourself. Um, and make those connections with people that um, you know you look up to for so long, and then eventually you kind of um, become friends with them. And I think that that's a really special, cool thing. Yeah, there's so much that just comes from getting that door opened. I remember a story of a conductor that I that I worked with, and he said they called him, and it was, I think it was the cover for a pretty a very good orchestra and it was like we need you we need you to do Sibelius too and they asked did you know it and he said yes I can do that tomorrow and it turns out after he had never actually studied the piece before and just learned it all in the next 24 hours but it really opens up those opportunities and just kind of remaining open and um, you never know where something something is going to take you I know for me just being um, just being asked to be on different committees at at my university there's I've met some really great people and gotten the chance to work with great colleagues that are outside the School of Music, which is so important, just kind of keeping everyone's head on straight. But there's always, um, there's always something to be gained from, from the opportunities that you, um, you, that you expose yourself to. Yeah, I agree. I say, like Jesse, yes to everything. And um, at my university, I say yes to everything, but I branch out, and so now I'm doing things with people across the university, which is so interesting to me, like worlds that I had no idea that existed, and hey, can you can we write this as an interdisciplinary course together? Sure, boy, that's interesting, and then I would have no idea, wow, I, I never even really looked at um, how this comes comes from a from a sociology standpoint to do a class in in uh, arts in the 19th century I mean wow this is really interesting you 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 learn a different level of respect for colleagues who, when you meet them in uh, what they do and you come together and work on a project across the university it's so interesting to me um, and so just say yes to all kinds of things and then like you figure out what you're doing. My advisor, when I went to my first college interview, said something to me at the last second. If there's a book in English, you can teach the course. <laughs> okay, so I get there and I'm doing my stuff. And then, you know, somebody on the committee said, well, you know, could you teach freshman theory? And I'm like, book in English. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. In you know, theory, I could. 
<laughs> no, really. And then could you teach, you know, music appreciation? And I'm thinking, yeah, book in English. Yeah, I could do that. Um, and then you figure out how to do it because, you know, it's, it's going to keep your world interesting. You know, not that the clarinet world is not interesting, but our repertoire is, is uh, smaller than pianist's repertoire. So there comes a point where, hey, I actually need some diversity in my life here of doing things that challenge me. Um, I remember one semester, ugh, I ended up with five people in a row playing Saint-Saëns Sonata. And so the next semester I was like, okay, I can't teach this because I, I, I couldn't remember what I said to one person versus another. And it was like, wow, just hearing this, that Sonata five times in a row on any day, I thought, oh, I just, this is too much. So, and don't sell yourself short. You, you can do it. You know, um, the first time I was during my master's degree, I wrote a paper on Polacek because I had walked into my lesson and I said, I'm playing this etude by Victor Polacek, but I don't know who this is. Do you know? And my teacher said, well, actually, I don't know about, much about him. You should research him. And so I ended up using it for a class at the time. And it turned out to be a, a decent paper. And he decided to publish it in the clarinet journals, my first article ever published. And I thought, I never would have thought I could publish an article in the clarinet journal. Are you kidding me? And, you know, I sent a copy to my grandparents. Like, it was a really big deal. I'll see my name in print. Um, and, and so that just goes to show that you can do it. You don't have to be, you don't have to be X, Y, and Z and have a DMA and have a job and this and that and have tenure to do stuff, but, but you can go ahead and do it. Everybody has something to offer. And if you work hard at it and, and submit it, you just never know in these professional organizations where you can find your niche and you can kind of like excel in something that you wouldn't have thought you could have. Well, and it might become your life's research. Right. You know, one of my graduate students was, you know, looking around for stuff and she wanted to do something that was personal to her and um, she's half Spanish and half Vietnamese and so she you know we started to look for Vietnamese composers which I was like wow I only know like one and so she looked around well since then she's interviewed him she's she taught me a, a I'm doing two of his works because he's so fantastic of a composer. And then I'm like, wow, I am learning so much here. But this will be end up to be her uh, thesis for her master's degree, which is, wow, this is something. So there are always things that uh, we don't know about. And we're waiting for you to bring it to our, our world. That, all these stories have reminded me of a time, and I know it's especially when we're stu when we're students. You know, we're being pulled in so many different directions with classes and lessons and rehearsals and everything. I remember a professor in my doctorate um, had sent me something about a conference that uh, I think uh, that she's like, you should apply to this, and I'm like, I'm pretty busy this semester. It was a paper. It was uh, the proposed topic. I think it was like a paper on um, oh, it was it was Mozart and um, Schenker and the in the concerto, like the exposition, how does this all kind of work together? And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it, but I'm really busy. And then she basically, in so many words, wrote back very politely and mentally, you should do this and stop arguing with me, <laughs> essentially. And I, re I remember th and I, that kind of launched sort of the a lot of the research I've done in terms of the relationship between perf music performance and music analysis. And that's kind of been like uh, like Jesse was saying, kind of like the sort of niche I find myself working in now, and th that wouldn't have happened had not had one professor told me to you know not be so stupid and just do what they told me to do. <laughs> I guess I'd like to just offer another side of this coin, especially, and I wouldn't necessarily suggest this for the younger student or the young professional but i will say as as you get on in your career and you've made some strides i think it is okay to say no sometimes um i mean while i think it's great to take every opportunity that you want to take i guess i would just like to also offer it is okay to say no 
I mean, I have, I have learned to do that because it makes me more sane. Um, and I know I need to do that. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to offer that side of the coin, but I think as we're younger and we're first starting out, yes, we have to try to take every opportunity and find all those opportunities to sometimes you make the opportunities happen. Right. And you want to do your best at everything you do. And so if you do take on too many things, then you're just being mediocre at everything. And that's not the ideal either. So I, I agree that kind of focusing on a few good things and doing your best, I think sometimes trumps this idea of doing everything. Well, and when you get to a place in your career where you're not building your resume, and Diane, you're right, you know, think about saying no so that that opportunity is open for someone else. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's super important. And, um, there's, I think one of the things that leads us to, you know, especially when we're young, we're just getting started, that leads us to say no is this, um, the feeling of imposter syndrome, where everyone is kind of like, I have no idea what, you know, it's like you feel like you're the outsider in this world where everyone else has their entire life and profession and career together. Everyone experiences this, you know, the moment where you feel like you're going to be found out that you're a fraud and just, um, just know that that is, um, a normal feeling and I, f I find this happens especially when people move uh, move on to like graduate school or you know just everywhere I'm, oh there's a great book about this but I and I can't remember what it's what it's called uh, but there are some really great books if you ever have that feeling of just like I have no idea what I'm doing and someone's gonna find out this is that is a normal feeling so it's just, it's take that kind of shove that little voice away in a, in a closet somewhere and say yes and let's talk a little bit about participating in professional organizations. I brought this up a little bit before, where don't just go to our conference if you're playing. Make the effort to go every single year to the conference. You know, honestly, the years I'm not playing, I actually enjoy more because I get to hear so many more things and I'm not panicked about, oh God, I've got to play, you know. Um, so it's really nice that, and, and people who know me know that I'm compulsive about, okay, I'm on the plane, I'm planning out exactly where I'm gonna go, when, how to get to this hall, I'm gonna hear so-and-so, I'm gonna hear this piece, and um, I'm constantly thinking about how can I serve this organization um, in a better way? And Jessica put up in our chat, this is great, Clarinet Fest 2021, and uh, that's good. Everybody should come. You know, and, and when we were in Reno, this going to be in Reno this summer, my entire studio was coming. They had it all planned. Who was driving and who was carpooling, and they were staying in, you know, these groups of rooms. And so I'm hoping that they're, uh, and I know they were talking about planning on going to Texas, so that would be fantastic. Good. As it relates to the Clarinet Fest, I remember not even being able to go till I was partway through my doctorate. And I, as, especially as students, it's so important to get. Oh, is is that Fritz? That's Fritz. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just saw this tail moving across. Diane, that's not very professional. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we'll have a talk later. <laughs> With um um oh, when you're a student, and it's really. And we're all working and everything. And uh, Jessica, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe we have some. There's like student travel grants that we that students can apply for to go to attend these conferences. And even if if um, you might check your own respective institutions as well, they might have some funding for student travel. Maybe even if you're not, if you don't have to be performing to apply for those, sometimes just go out and investigate those resources and. Um, and um, also the volunteer opportunities through the Clarinet Fest is a great way to um, get in. And then you're also getting to interact with people and, you know, st stage handing or manning the exhibit halls. And that's a great way to um, get into something, to get into to be able to go to the Clarinet Fest without necessarily having the, maybe all the finances to do so. Because I do reckon that that's a bar that is a barrier sometimes. And I, just know those resources are out there. Yeah, my university uh, has travel grants for students, and so they can get up to $650 to attend a professional conference. They don't even have to, and they can get more if they're presenting. So, and uh, at least at my school, so I'm going to 
suggest that everybody check with their associated students or whatever your comparable organization is because they often have money for this. We don't have anything formal, but some students asked the dean a couple years ago, and the dean was so impressed that they wanted to go to this thing, he found money for them. So sometimes just by asking, <laughs> you can make things happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad David brought up the, the subject of volunteering at Clarinet Fest. That is such an awesome way for our students to literally, I mean, walk right by some amazing clarinetists and, and, and get to meet them. That is extraordinary. And talk about a great way to start networking with people. From all over the world. Right. Yeah. Be back there to watch what they do before they walk on stage. I mean, you, you just right. learn so much, you know? Yeah. Great. Well, how about if we, we end our, I mean, we've got a half hour left, so uh, make sure that you write any questions you have in the chat section. Um, but let's talk about, you know, how do people start now, okay? About punctuality, email etiquette, bios, CVs, social media presence, all those kinds of things. Yes, to everything you said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I think you, you hinted on this again yesterday uh, with the emails. And um, I'm a little, I, I'm, I'm more um, sympathetic for people that don't understand if the DMA doesn't mean doctor or whatever. But I think it is smart to have a little bit more than just um, your question. If you can have some kind of uh, introduction about, I hope you're having a good day, some kind of salutation at the end. Um, I think of writing an email more like letter writing than texting. Um, and it is hard when you're blurring the lines. I have several students that do communicate with me via Facebook Messenger. Well, that's kind of like a texting medium. And, and so it gets a little bit tricky sometimes, but I think um, it's always better uh, than not to try and take a little extra time with your email and to write it in, in a way that is more respectful and um, just considerate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and using dear professor so-and-so, introduce yourself. I'm. You know, my name is so-and-so. Uh, I'm a senior at this high school because often they'll want to know what high school you're at because that, like, I always like to send a uh, note to the band director. Hey, thanks for, you know, letting me know about, you know, your student and, uh, you know, and be very respectful and um, have, you might consider having a professional email account if your email account is not just your name so because honestly when i'm looking back through emails it's it's much easier for me to remember oh hey jessica harry's email says jessica harry and then i know that <laughs> rather than too sexy for you then i'm trying to think <laughs> whose email address is that plus you might not want an email address that is that uh, informal um before we go on um Ashley's writing, if you happen to make a professional mistake, what is a way to rectify it in the best way possible? Apologize. Instantly. Own it. I mean, own it. Yeah. Own it. Right. Everyone I know has sent an email to someone that they did not mean to send that email to. <laughs> and so you instantly, I am so sorry. I did not mean to send this email, copy you on this email. Please forgive whatever it was that you did in that email, but own it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. And sooner than later, I think. That, yeah. Yeah. That I think like that if you just, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of starting on day one uh, was kind of ingrained into me from graduate school when I was a GTRA and uh, the kind of supervisor for all of us came into the room and said, um, you're done being a student, you're a professional now. And so this idea that you shouldn't wait till you get a job, that you need to start acting like a professional before you are a professional. And I think that goes to what uh, Denise's great quote, the student you are is the professional you wanna be. It's very similar to that idea that um, if you start acting like the, the um, you know, what you'd envision for the career to be, then you're gonna start kind of having more success. Um, but starting right away and, and not thinking, oh, I'll be professional later when I'm such and such age, but mm -hmm. go ahead and start having that mindset now. 
Yeah, and that, I think that goes not just to email in terms, of, in terms of sort of crafting or cultivating your image, but it's your demeanor and how, how you interact when you go to conferences, whether it's, you know, the Clarinet Fest or your state music ed conference. It's how you present yourself on social media. It's how you, um, it's how you interact when you don't think people are watching. Mm -hmm. Because you never know who's going to be walking just as a sort of passerby on your conversation. And you might say something that... Um, that they that they might take offense to, and it, it, maybe they'll call you out on it. Maybe you won't, but that'll definitely get filed back in someone's memory. And who know who knows what you might need from someone down the road. So, how about you know? Let's talk a little bit about online presence and social media, because everybody has it now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Where to start, right? I know. Um, yeah. Make sure what you put online is truly um, what you want to put online because you just don't know who is looking and who is out there. So um, you don't want to have um, something out there that's not who you see yourself as. So, and it doesn't mean that you cannot be true to yourself. You absolutely can be. But, you know, when it gets, when you get asked about it, you have to own it then. Yes, that is what I truly believe. I believe X. You know, I have no problem uh, talking about that because that is what I truly believe in myself. And I believe that others should have this, you know, I believe that no one should be cruel to animals. I have no trouble saying that on social media, you know. It's interesting to me to see some social media accounts where, like a, I just saw one the other day that said, uh, <laughs> in some discussion, it said, I don't date women or hire them who have short hair. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and I didn't even know this person. And I was like, so of course, you know, I'm having this conversation with another clarinetist. Who is this? He goes, yeah, I saw that. And it was like, wow, why would you put that out there? <laughs> Uh. And kind of going off of that, I know there's um, the presence of social media. If if it just because it maybe doesn't come back, something you say or do doesn't come back to bite you now. People, uh, to borrow the to borrow an expression, people are keeping the receipts as it would turn out, and things are getting brought up, screenshots of conversations and things from you know five ten years ago, or you know this person acted this way toward someone else when they were a student in conservatory or something like that. So there's, you, ne you never know when something might come back to hit you in the worst way possible. So just don't even put that material out there. And especially with social media, just because you have a protected account or a locked account or whatever, someone will find a way to dig it up. So. Um, we didn't talk about this in professionalism, but I've seen this, uh, occasionally conversations between a student clarinetist and then a professional clarinetist talking about the teacher that they study with and oh I'm about to change teachers and I don't like this here's what my teacher is doing and this is like a public conversation mm -hmm. and it's oh my gosh so never have those kinds of conversations but if this comes up that you are going to change teachers and that happens you know, the conversation happens with your teacher first, you know, and then you don't have that conversation on social media. It is not a good place to discuss that. Um, just because you have a particular experience doesn't mean other people are having that same experience. So there could be all kinds of ways into that. I tell our music education students that if, if you wouldn't be comfortable showing it to your grandmother, don't post it, you know, don't put it on there. Right. Jessica Harry wrote in the comments, if you have to think whether or not you should say something, don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there, you know. Yeah. I... And going off of what Julia said, that also I feel like applies to us as teachers, especially with private studios and, you know, where everyone's trying to kind of grind and hustle to get students. But don't, don't go poaching around for other teachers. That's just not cool. Well, and when a student brings up, hey, I, I think I'm going to transfer to this school, your your answer to them is fantastic. They are a great teacher. 
I mean, that's it. I, well, I mean, they are, obviously, but there shouldn't be any point where you're trying to then convince them, oh, no, you should stay here. No, no, no. There's, there's all kinds of reasons why people move schools. Um, and it can be, hey, this is a financial thing for me. I am barely making it here, but this other school has a scholarship for me. Well, you really cannot... I mean, that is something that school is so expensive, and if a student can find a deal where they have to pay less, congratulations to them. They really, or if it's just that, hey, I can live at home and go to this university, fantastic. Or I went to a summer camp and I really connected with this person. Well, great. Congratulate them and wish them well and, you know, keep in touch and say, you know, send them an email in the first couple weeks of their new school and say, hey, I hope you're doing well. We really miss you here. But what's unfortunate is that a lot of times these students just transfer and they don't tell, you know, I've had that happen to me yeah. where they transfer to me and I find out, oh. well, why did you do that? And, and, oh, well, I didn't even tell so-and-so. I'm like, oh, oh, you know, talk about burning bridges and we just don't want to do that, you know? Well, and that's happened to me. And whenever a student says, oh, I'm going to transfer from so on, I, my first statement to them is, do you mind if I call your teacher? Because I'm not going down that path of poaching a student. Right. And then I have a conversation with whomever it is. And they say, you know, we just haven't been able to connect. Okay, well then, you know, I've opened the door for a conversation that they have, or that the, they've already had that conversation with their teacher, but I don't want it to be something on my list of egregious, non-professional behavior, and I don't want somebody else to think that, hey, I recruited a student of yours. Right, right. It always goes back to acting in the way you want to be treated, how you, you know, whether it be as a student or a professional, always always think about it in that lens and we will tend to make better decisions professionally i think well and daniel's made a comment in the chat musicians have great memories mm -hmm. and diane i can remember seeing students who are now professionals but students of mine who had just been transferred away but never said a word it's like i will remember this forever <laughs> and a simple conversation <laughs> could have been oh yeah i remember you studying with me Hmm. Any any other things you all want to discuss that we have failed to talk about? Mm -hmm. And please, those those watching, please write some questions for our panelists. I'll maybe hop in with one thing, and, I, and this is obviously with a grain of salt, but perfect, and especially in terms of online. Professional and like, I get I don't know, boring for maybe lack of a better term. Those are, they are not like, one does not necessarily mean the other. You can still like, I'm not saying don't use, you know, social media at all, but just again, again sort of monitor what you're putting out there. Because I think sometimes we're, I don't, I don't want to come across as anti these tools because especially in like, in COVID times, it's be important to maintain those connections with people, but just, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Jessica wants to know, can we talk about the relationship between undergrad and grad? Yeah, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, I love having graduate students. We don't have a doctoral program in the CSUs, but we have master's programs, and I purposely keep my master's uh, students down to no more than 10% of my undergrads because I want to make sure that uh, undergrads actually have opportunities. But my undergrads have to look up to my grad students, and they do. And I treat my graduate students as if they are faculty and will, because they are. I mean, they should be that, they're in graduate school now. So it's like, I, you know, can you run studio class? Hey, I need you mm -hmm. to do the following. And I don't treat them like they're undergrads, which is, and undergrads get treated in a progressively more responsible way. 
you know, as a freshman, it's like this and this and this. But I just surprised one of my sophomores when I said, you know, hey, I want you to listen to the following pieces and I want you to pick two of these. And he was like, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, this is up to you now. And he was like, oh, you know, I said, and then we're, go we're going to be going to step three, which is where you have to bring me suggestions, you know, but um, I want my grad students to be role models for my undergrads. Not that I'm not a role model, but undergrads often can't see the distance between where they are and where I am, but they can see where a grad student is. Both musically and personally, you can you can learn a lot of the undergraduates by watching the graduate students, how they interact with each other, um, how they have a work ethic, and they practice at 8 a.m. on a Friday. They're up there doing their long tones. All of a sudden, they're like, wow, maybe I need to be start stepping up and doing that. And I just feel like it really sets a great example for the younger students and what they could be doing and achieving by having a few grad students that, mm -hmm. that highlight that. But I, I agree. I try and treat them just as professionals. Um, they're always surprised uh, when, when they get here that they can check out library materials for way longer than the undergrads. And it's, you know, these little perks, they don't have to pay for parking and um, that sometimes being a graduate student kind of is enabled. But, mm -hmm. but I like the idea of progressing through the undergrad that you start out a little bit more structured and here's how we're going to do things. And then you start to free up once they've earned kind of the, the ability to be able to be more flexible in lessons. Mm -hmm. Jessica uh, included another statement. I think in smaller programs, it can be difficult to draw a line professionally. It is important for grads and for juniors and seniors to demonstrate the expectations of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Millican, where I teach, it's un we're, we're an undergraduate only institution. And it's I'm always kind of, I'm really banking on the seniors and the juniors to sort of model the behavior and just kind of how sort of culture and uh, in terms of the school and how to kind of, kind of how do we go about these things. I also do want to express complete shock that uh, master students didn't have to pay for parking, like Jesse said. Yeah, I know, right? I am stunned, and I I wish I could have uh, like several thousand dollars back. <laughs> hey, I have to pay for parking as a faculty member. Oh my goodness. Well, we yeah. have a lot of space around Truman, so there's plenty. Of space we have so there's you know I, I have a quick question if we have the time for the rest of you and that's how you deal with endorsements professional endorsements and um you know it seems like a tricky thing at different times and can get into ethical situations about um you know endorsing this line of clarinet this line of reed and kind of what what trickiness i know several of you have different endorsements that you you know do artistic sponsorships and things like that how do you deal with that well um, I can answer for myself. Um, when I moved to California, um, I switched to playing Daddario Reeds because they're a local business. Now, while they're an international business, their factory is 10 minutes from my house. Hmm. So, and they were, they, before I became an artist, and this continued after I became an artist for them, they were like, what can we do for you? And they were helping me pay for guest artists to come in because I was a new faculty member. I had no money to do anything. I would always be their first call. Hey, we have so-and-so coming to the factory. Do you want a master class from them? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so there is that. I mean, support your local businesses. It is so important. Um, but that being said, I have all kinds of different students who play all kinds of different reads. I have no, I don't say, hey, you have to play this, you have to play this. Now, interestingly enough, the first time I asked Daddario, um, you know, hey, I've got this woodwind methods class that I'm teaching. They're like, what, what reads do you need? So every year since then, they just send my university, even though I haven't taught that class for 15 years, they just send us all the reads that we need for that class. So local companies really keep our economy going, and they, they employ so many people over here uh, at the factory, and it's just a great institution. Um, for uh, Silverstein and for Buffet, every manufacturer uh, that I know of um, is a great company, and, and again, my students play all varieties of instruments. Before I was a Buffet artist, I was a Selmer artist. I could honestly tell you 
every professional clarinet from any of these companies is an excellent instrument and I have a big variety in my studio so I love the support that they give me to bring artists in but it's Buffet gives me tons of support but so does Bakun, so does Selmer, so does LeBlanc or now and Yamaha they all offer things for my students which is exactly what I need them for. Kind of going along with that, uh, as as a buffet artist, you know, you know, I obviously, well, I'll say first that I stand by the products, and you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be associated if I didn't really believe in that. It's not, and it's not just lip service. But that being said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, if it's, I've got students who are looking for new clarinets right now, and you know, I'm going to try and find the best deal and what, what's um, not just financially. Uh, the most accessible, but what's going to help them the best? And for some people, a different um, different clarinet might have a different sound or a different feel that might just work better for them. Same thing with mouthpieces and reeds and ligatures and all of that. I it, I feel like it's about trying to help each student get to their best uh, best time playing the instrument, regardless of if I regardless of whether or not it would work for me. I want to find what works for them always most important mm -hmm. it's it's so and I am so lucky that uh, Yamaha will come in here and Buffet and Selmer and my students have the opportunity to try all these different wonderful clarinets and um, then they can find what gives them their voice just because I prefer something and I'll have students who be like well I want to play what you play no you don't play what 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 you sound right on. I may have some other idea of a sound in my head. So, uh, but they all, I, you know, and honestly, whenever a student will say, hey, what does one of my other students play? And I'm like, I don't know. What do they play? I mean, I can't remember. I could look at it when they're in front of me, but uh, it's like, oh gosh, I don't remember, you know, what they play, which is exactly what it should be. That's their voice. I should draw I should also say I also can't ever remember what my colleagues play so mm -hmm. I you know maybe this is sacrilege to say but it's like who's an artist for whom I I usually don't know that thing that thing but whatever instrument um, I am playing I would never offend that company by playing another one I have made an agreement to that company and that's my agreement as an artist that I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to say I'm playing your instrument or your ligature or your reeds or your mouthpiece, and then I'm not going to do it. That's That just seems um, deceptive to me. Mm -hmm. um, before we uh, wrap, we've got 10 minutes. Somebody writes, if it's possible to share this, how were those of you who are endorsed by professional organizations, equipment, instruments, approached by said organizations? Did you have to seek them out or you approached by them? I was approached by all of them. I, I actually saw, uh, sought out and um, sought out both Buffet and Silver Scene, and not as kind of a trying to not as trying to like get something, obviously, but just trying to you know build up that relationship. And I view like I kind of view what I'm trying to do as serving the serving the community of musicians. You know, what can I do to help with these with these products that I really really enjoy using and trust and believe in the quality of it and this um this kind of this goes back a little bit to um uh kind of that imposter syndrome but i remember talking with uh someone who i really trust on this matter and they're like just go ask what's the worst thing they're going to say no or or try again you know try again later and and sometimes that's you just got to go ask and again the worst thing that people will say is no yeah, I actually got introduced to Francois Clock of Buffet by um, Bruce Marking, who was friends, uh, I was friends with him and he was uh, their repair person. And he's, you know, I think it was at, oh, I have no idea which festival, but he says, oh, you've got, you know, I need to introduce you to Francois, you know, and, and that's how the conversation just kind of started. But I've known others to, um, to approach uh, a company and, 
and say, I, you know, I love, I believe in your products. If you would consider me being an artist, I, you know, please let me know if you need to me to send you any information. I mean, I just think, you know, it's, it's both ways. Oftentimes they approach you. Sometimes you can just approach them. It doesn't hurt to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes they need um, artists and you're like in their minds, but they need artists in a specific area of the country. Right. And you just happen to be, hey, you reached out and you said, hey, I'm interested in doing this. And they're like, wow, we need an artist in, you know, Medford, Oregon. Right. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I can't think of any two better professionals than Dr. Ganey and Dr. Barger. Do you guys have anything to add? You should be the panelists for this one, really. <laughs> well, first of all, Jesse, you can call us Diane and Denise. I'm trying to be professional here. <laughs> You're my friend, so you can call me Diane. <laughs> no, I, I mean, gosh, you guys have shared so much great information. Yeah. I love um, having people that we respect and admire being here to share with us and inspire our students who are watching and, and our other colleagues. It's just great to hear things from people who are out there doing it successfully um, and you know, at different stages of our careers. I think it's really important to see how professionalism um, changes. It starts young. Yeah, it starts, starts young. How we kind of grow with it and, you know, hopefully hopefully we inspire other people by our actions i think that's a, a good goal for us all to have um just try to help each other to get better and to do better um to make our what we do what we love to be enjoyable and to help us all be successful in it um i just keep going back to you know as you know my first job as a middle school band director you know and i learned so much from that that has impacted what i do today you know and including teaching some music education courses which i'm very passionate about but I just always go back to thinking, you know, the words of Cliff Matson at Florida State and, you know, the, the teacher you are is the professional you'll be and just kind of trying to help our students get in that mindset that you don't just magically, a fairy doesn't come and tap you on the head, now you're a professional. It's, you know, all the things that you're doing, all the experiences that you accept, that you go out and do and are helping to build you as, as the person, the future professional that you want to end up being. So you kind of keep that eye on the goal, but the goal starts now in this very moment. I think that's one of the most important things that I hope our students listening will, will consider and realizing that you've got great resources out there. If you're not sure about something, ask, email. You've got you know people right here who are just fantastically successful in their careers and wonderful teachers and mentors. And if you don't have somebody that you feel like you can ask a question, you can email any of them, I'm sure. And ask there's great resources out there you know just to try to do better than um, I, I said this the other day too but the maya angelou quote you know not quite perfectly but you know when you know better do better and so don't feel bad if you've not done these things or if you've done something wrong quote unquote compared to what we've talked about today just learn from it and now so make a shift and try to do a better job the next time right and i think quite frankly all of us in this room right now we are constantly evolving and trying to do better. Hope so. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so so we're 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 constantly trying to to be better professionals, even if we think we know it. You know, we know it all. We're still learning. We learn from our students um, a lot, um, and we learn from our peers and our colleagues. So this has been a great. Um, this has just been a great weekend. Uh, thank you all so very much from Denise and I um, and our first Amakitia clarinet extravaganza. We will have all of these videos from the weekend. They will stay on our Amakitia Duo Facebook page. And eventually in the, in the next few days, we will upload them onto our YouTube channel. Um, so they will be there so you can share that with, with anybody. Um, and then we also plan to do another um, Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza weekend, the first weekend in March 2021. So if any of you have any particular ideas of what kind of session themes you'd like, we've already been hearing from some of you, just email us. And uh, we just love if this is something that the pandemic has, has given us as a gift. It's this idea that we can use this kind of platform to reach out to people immediately and just have some fun and celebrate the clarinet and enjoy each other's company yeah what a great collection of knowledge you know i've learned so much and i feel very inspired 
I wish I had a session like this to watch when I was a student. I would have learned a lot. So thank you for bringing this out. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Denise and Diane and, and Jessica. It's been great. Well, thank you all. Thank you all to our attendees. You guys all stay safe out there and be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.